let me go to YouTube and refresh because I don't trust YouTube. They always say you're connected. <laughs> and then 15 yeah. minutes later, you're looking at the screen like this and right. somebody tells you, hey, we're not seeing you. Okay, but we are connected. Hello, everybody. As I was saying, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on the time on the day you're watching this. In my case, I'm having a time travel experience with our guest here because she's seven hours after us, or we are seven hours ahead, as you can imagine. So this is not only a conversation about comics. We're doing time traveling. And aside of that, Emil, give me two, just two minutes to do my public service announcement of the day. Sorry, because I, I am going to curse. I'm telling you that. Use your fucking mask. Wear your fucking mask. This is not, I repeat, the mask is not meant to protect you. It's meant to protect others from you. It can protect you, sure, but that's not the point. The point is we have to protect others. We have to help others. Yeah. And we have to be decent, not assholes. You have to protect the elders. You have to protect the children. If they tell the, the children don't get COVID-19, that's a fucking lie. And they can die. Don't be an idiot. Don't go and see a friend, girlfriend, relative after six months and say, oh, oh, my God, I miss you so much. Give him or her a hug and then get them with this because you can kill them. And even if you don't kill them, there's something that is called chronic illnesses because a lot of people after having COVID for six months already, lung problems, so you, brain problems, you know, encephalitis. That's uh, true. Very good friend of mine, and he was very sick. He was so sick he almost died, and he was very fit and healthy, and yet uh, he became very ill. And he's still recovering, and he got it in July. See? So that's a very long recovery. See? So it's not only about death. It's about the consequences. Mm -hmm. It is very serious. Right. And last but not least, as I always say, if you think you're too important, that your freedom, or blah, 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 your religion, whatever the fuck, I don't care. It's too important for you to literally care for others. Leave this channel now. I don't want potential murderers here. And this is not a joke. Sorry, Mia, about that. I, I, I just have to, to get that off my chest. No, I think it's a good thing. How are you? How are you? How are Great. things? How's uh, things in your neck of the woods? Are they getting better? Are they still crazy? How is it? Um, I think, um, I think there's some great things that have happened in the United States. Um, I think we had the time to pay attention to our, uh, race problems. And, uh, that's a small, very, that's a very big subject. And it, the word race problems don't even, doesn't even describe it. We, we have serious, serious, uh, systemic racism in, in our country. And uh, I think we, uh, because we weren't sick, I mean, because we weren't uh, working all the time, we were able to see it and protest and think about it and think about how we want our children to live here, what mm -hmm. kind of place we want to give them. And we, a lot of us realized the place we had wasn't the place we want to leave them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think some very good changes have been made here. I'm not sure what it's like in the rest of the world. What about with you? Here, of course, we, we have the advantage of not having Trump as a president and that kind of government. So right. it's all it's been all based on the on the science, on the scientists, you know, following the advice. So we have really big peaks and then lows. Now we're we were ahead of the rest of Europe on the second wave. But of course, you get Black Friday or whatever. People is stupid. They go out. They I didn't. Out. And of course, this week, the week before Christmas, uh, the government is saying we have to restrict everything even more for Christmas because you went out on Black Friday when we told you to stay home. And the numbers are doing this again. Not this. This. Right. So it's a mess. It's a mess because, as you know, it's people that will listen. Um, people who will just not. So, but, but 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 for the rest of it, you know, we're in good hands. I guess doesn't matter the you know the color of the the color of the politician you like or the, the right of left. 
they're trying to follow the science, which is the, the only thing that matters to me. Right. If they follow the science, we'll be okay. Sooner That's or later, right. we'll be okay. And we seems we are going to have the vaccines, the, the, the one you already have in the US, the first ones. We're going to have it on the 27th. Good. And okay. they're going to start, as you know, you know, the health people first, elders, elder people first, people with, you know, some sanitary risks. It's, it's on the way to happen. But uh, I keep telling people, this is not going to be solved in I don't know, two months. It's not. You're right. It's going to take a year yeah, because yeah. you have to get herd immunity. You have to get herd immunity in Spain. The government, you know, the, the health ministry or minister already said immunity, herd immunity is not going to happen until August at least. That doesn't mean full vaccination. That means 40, 50, 60 percent. Full vaccination maybe is going to be in October of next year. So it's almost going to take a year to get everybody vaccinated. Right. And we are 47 million. You guys are 350. Yeah. Right. So you probably are going to get a lot more vaccines because, you know, the labs are also mostly American. So I hope, you know, one one way, one thing compensates each other. But it's not going to be a short thing. I, I'm just trying to – people is – I guess that's one of the other reasons people is relaxing, right? Do you think it's the same there? People is relaxing because they see the vaccine and they're like, oh, the vaccine is coming, so I can do whatever I want. Do you think it's the same there? I don't go out, so I don't know. <laughs> Just, That's a good point. I, I can't. I, I don't know. Um, I do, on the few occasions that I have gone out, I've seen people, some people very responsible and others not at all. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> okay, imagine I'm your doctor. My name is... This is going to sound familiar to you. I just changed my name. My name is Victor Frankenstein. This is my syringe. I just popped it into you and say, you have the vaccine. Everything is over. You're free. Trust me, nothing else, nothing bad is going to happen to you. And what's the first thing what's the first thing you could do that you've been missing for months and months? That the first thing you could do and like, oh my God, I need to do this. Well, I'd go two places. I think I would travel right away. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, three places. I'd go downtown to see my museum. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a very good. There's a couple good show exhibits up at the Art Institute, and then I'd get on a train because I like to travel by train, and I'd go to New Mexico, which is where my fa a lot of my well my family's there, mm -hmm. and um, I love it there. My uh, I think my heart is there in some mm -hmm. ways, and then I'd get on a plane and I'd come to you guys. I'd come to Europe because. Uh, I love you guys. Uh, mm -hmm. I love you so much. Um, so you, you know it's mutual. So <laughs> I found that out, which was crazy for me mm -hmm. to find that out. I mean, I, I'm just, you know, nobody really. And then you were very, all of you were very, very nice to me. Uh, so it was wonderful being there. And you have a different relationship with art. You have a much deeper relationship with art than most people, most people do, mm -hmm. and certainly I love my country, but we don't value. I mean, the the vast majority of people I think have a appreciation for art, but we're not raised to really look. That's part of the reason I wrote my book, is that I wanted people to know that the art, the great art in the world was their birthright. It belongs mm -hmm. to them. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I used to take people to the museum and then tell them the stories of the artists' lives. Like Francis Bacon was caught with a, with a, with a, um, with a farmhand mm -hmm. and he was horsewhipped out of his house. And he was completely rejected by his family because he was gay. Mm -hmm. And when you start telling people the stories of the lives of the artists, they're engaged. And then they look differently at the paintings. They look at them and they say, this man is telling me all of that in this painting. He's telling me about the broken quality of his life. Mm -hmm. And they're engaged and uh, I wanted that, mm -hmm. you know, I want, I wanted that in the book. 
So I would go and do those three things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, imagine okay. you know at the Prado. At the Prado. At the Prado, of course. Well, oh, which, of course the, the Prado is your favorite of the three. Um. Because it depends. Say, Many it depends on I the artist. The museum in Barcelona. No, I no. The three. I mean, I mean the three in Madrid. You know, Prado, Sofia, oh. and Thyssen. I I liked the the uh, Thyssen. I liked that a lot. Um, but the Prado is my favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's the go -ass. It's yeah. the go -ass. That's that's what I was going to mention when you said about you know telling the life story of the of the painters of the artists. I was going to tell you. Imagine telling them right. about Goya's life. Oh my gosh, it's it's really I, he's in a class by himself. Yeah, uh, he's in a class by himself, and the man's soul is it's it's like you have a sense that that's just a tiny. Those paintings are just a tiny portion of it. Absolutely. What, what and who he was, I don't think we. I don't think we will see uh, the like of him again in the history of the world. No, I, because you know, I th I think Velázquez was probably this, that is my opinion. You can disagree, of course. In terms of perfection, probably well, the most perfect. perfect you know right. what I mean, painter perfect. ever. But you could follow that in many yeah. ways, yeah. following that type of art. You know, like, as in comics, realistic art is a pattern that somebody else can follow. Right. But Goethe just broke it all. He and, broke he kept, and he kept breaking it. He kept 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 breaking until the end of his life. Well, he, he was, I, um, when I was a kid, there were these paintings and they were up in the Art Institute and it, the paintings are of a person being executed. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't realize that I loved these paintings. I had to visit them. I put one of them in the book and there are se a sequence and I was told when I was in Spain, you realize that is the first comics sequence, one of them in art. That's another thing I was going to tell you. You went ahead of me. For me and many people, Goja is the first comics, comic book it's artist. True. It's true. It's true. And it's amazing. I mean, I'm, I was so thrilled when I was there looking at the work. You know? Would you recommend comic creators? To go back and check Goya to learn about to learn oh, about the comics language. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I don't feel I don't feel so weird anymore. <laughs> it's all there. I I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. He's uh, and he was a bobo, which is the part that I love the most, in his own way, which is the best. You know, his personal way. He was a storyteller. Yeah, definitely. There's other painters, of course, they are all storytellers, but it's just the image of what you have there. But Goya wanted to tell you the full story. He did. Okay, so and he was uh, an animator. I mean, there's a quality of animation in his work too. That's um, true. You, you feel like you're watching movement. You're watching something happen, and it, it could start happening again because mm -hmm. the way he paints, the looseness of his painting, it, it gives you the sense that there's movement in this work in mm -hmm. a way that I don't, I didn't at that period when, who was painting that way? Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, yeah, it's about, I think, I don't think nobody ever before or nobody after. No. That's why I say he's in a class of his own because yeah. in other cases you can, you can see, you can say, okay, Velázquez appeared because there was this, this and this guy before him and this and this guy after him. In Goya's case, you see his beginnings, and of course he was a royal painter too. Mm -hmm. But there's some, more, but even then he was already trying, you know, in La Maja and other things. If mm -hmm. you check, if you really, you know, look in depth, mm -hmm. take your time. You see that he was already trying to sneak things. I know. And then he was always doing that. And then bit by bit he gets away. He gets away. He gets away. And then that's what I say. Do you have anybody like him before or after? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. It's like he didn't create a school because nobody could uh, imitate him in a way, right? right? Well, and I don't think that was his journey. His journey wasn't – his journey was – he had so much work to do. I, I don't think he had the time to do that in his life. Yeah. You know? I think he was on the, on the same school of thought as uh, – as Picasso, you know, Picasso was always saying the, oh, 
are you waiting for the muse? I, I guess you know this this phrase. And right. Picasso just said, "What? No, I I hope I'm I'm waiting for the for the muse to find me working." Right. I'm not going to for the muse to God and catch me and tell no, me anything. Sure. I'll be working. If it comes, it'll come. Yeah. And I think it's the I, same I with Roger. We was yeah. working all the time. I'm sorry to say I'm not putting myself in that class, but I will say that um, I feel that about work that um, you just have to work. Mm -hmm. Art is a job. Yeah. It's a job. Exactly. Um, and you work. <laughs> and, and I mean, do you agree with do you agree with them too? that you need to learn how to do things the most perfect way and to then, then be able to break them all. Absolutely. That's what Picasso said. I, 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 it took me so many years to, to learn how to do it, to be able to break it. Did you agree with them? I do. The only thing that I would say is that um, I, I think when I started the comic, I didn't really know how to do it the way everybody else would do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that worked for me. And I can't quite understand what happened with that, except that I was working on a page um, last night, and I realized that I'm I'm just constantly solving problems. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just every minute, it's just problems. And it's almost like being on a game show. You know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just, on my own game show. If mm -hmm. I win, that means I create a page that I really like mm -hmm. because it's, it's sometimes the problems are not even problems that you could explain to somebody. It's just intuitive. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you want this page to make the reader uncomfortable. How are you going to do that? How are you going to use the composition to make them uncomfortable? Everybody has a different formula for that. Uh, I, I happen to admire classic comics enormously. I find myself looking at that and thinking, man, I could never do that. I, mm -hmm. I, I love this. this is, so people say, well, do you like this? Or do you like Marvel? Or do you like DC? And I say, yeah, I admire it, all of it, you know? So. Yeah. Oh, how, how much do you like the old EC comics? Well, I love them. I love them very much. And it was very interesting. I found out when I was in Spain, I didn't know this prior, that many of the uh, great horror comics had been illustrated by Spanish artists. Yes, yes. I didn't know that. And yeah. uh, I proceeded to do some research about that. And it was exciting to discover all these incredible artists who frequently didn't really even get to receive credit for their work. You know, they weren't properly credited, which is a crime. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, amazing work, amazing work. Well, until this is one of the things that people don't get uh, Stan credit for, but Stan was the first one who started crediting people. Oh, that's really incredible. Yeah. With, with, with Marvel, it was him. It, he gave credit to people. And people don't know. realize, and I keep telling them, before Stan Lee and Marvel Comics, people wasn't credited in the comics. They weren't. Know that. And I then... Didn't. Wow. And in the UK, it was 2000 AD. It was Pat Mills as the editor, uh, Kevin O'Neill, also wow. an artist, as the, as the uh, art director, it started to sneak the names so they, so nobody noticed. And when they realized nobody was saying anything, like in wow. issue four or something, Pat told me, they put them there like, okay, nobody's protesting. Let's put them. And That's nobody said anything because 2000 AD was selling like nothing has sold in the US for the last 25 right. years. Right, right, right. Well, wow. so, so that's, that's a good thing. I didn't realize that. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Pat, Pat told me a story about because people was crediting him about. I had him like you know, a month ago here, and people was crediting for him for it. And he was like, "Wait a minute. Yes, I was the editor, but the credit has to go to Kevin. Kevin told me, and I accepted it. But the one who as our director is Nick the names, mm -hmm. it was him. And then I looked the other way. Okay. So I told him, well, then the, then the merit goes to you both because you were the editor. Oh, got it, yeah. You could have said no. So uh, the, the, it's really it's really special when you realize and you are told why and how. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also absurd to see 
how they try to hide the names of the artists, you know, of the, um, even in, even in movies, I, I was, I was hearing about history of, of, of movies, you know, and, um, of cinema, like, uh, let me see, two weeks ago, and the beginning, you know, the, the real beginning, and the real beginning, of course, it was Edison, who was a bastard, and other people, and they never credited anybody. They never, especially the actors, they because they were they didn't want people to know who they were, and they didn't want them to become big. That's the main reason why United Artists was created. Interesting. I didn't know this. That's very interesting. So, and then of course they they, they created the MPCC, which was you know like the big conglomerate run by Edison, designed to kill anybody else who who wanted to make movies, but the other side was who know was it Universal. Warner Brothers, you know, everybody at their beginning on their first five years. So that's the reason they moved to the West Coast. Because if they try to do movies, Edison and his Edison and his guys will send people to kill them, to beat them and to destroy the movies. Wow. So they moved to the West Coast because it was so difficult to get there back and in the beginning of the 20th century. You know, the first movies were made in Chicago. A lot of movies. I yeah, mean, Chicago, New York, etc. So the thing is, like, they have all the mafia. Edison had all the mafia, you know, and he get he got killed. Some of the French people that the Lumiere brothers were sending, he stole movies from Melier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when they moved to the West Coast, he couldn't stop them, and that's how Hollywood was created. It was merely merely because they needed to get away as far as possible from the from the Edison good, mafia. There's a good movie in that. Oh yeah. There's, would be a great movie, you know. Yeah, and another, and, and then that's when they started creating the actors. You know why? Because he said the others don't do it. Mm. We'll do it to be different. And then they, yeah. and then like uh, I don't know, a year later, we were like, "Fuck!" Now they're becoming big and have to pay them more money. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's yeah. in their face. Now they have power. Well, what is that? I mean, what do you think about that? About artists having power? About artists having power? I think it should be the rule. Good, I like that too. You know, uh, if it's your creation, of course the studio system, they were bastards well, of all of them, let's be honest, you know. The, the Edison people, and then of course these other guys established the studio system, which was yeah. using the actors, the director, etc., mostly as, as their slaves, you know. Full, full life contracts, six, seven, eight, whatever, 10 movie contracts. If you didn't do it, they didn't pay you anything, blah, 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 so. Boger, I think, like had like a 15-year contract with Warner Brothers or something like that. So by the end of the day, they were slavers anyway. So they were all bad. Let's not say Edison was the only bad guy. The other guys found ways to be evil <laughs> in the other coast. So the moment that started to be broken, that's when artists, you know, started to get into power. In part, I think, thanks to television. You know, the directors that came from television, like Freaking or Frankenheimer and others, were the first ones, in a way, who had other vision, and they weren't so close to the studio system. And of course, Kirk Douglas becoming his own producer, and Bad Lancaster, the the pioneers. So, and I think now some creators, my opinion, need to need to remember when to you know stomp the table and saying, like the NBA players. I always sorry, but I always use the NBA. The NBA goes on a strike every two or three years. It's like, this is the agreement. No. The team, the arena, the team, the, you know, the television channel, blah, 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 are getting this money. Who the fuck is playing? Me. Who the fuck is breaking his legs or having a, a, illness for, a chronic illness for the rest of his life when he leaves this game? Blah, 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 blah. Me. And you're getting a bigger cut, a bigger cut than me? No, that's, that's the thing with publishing is, oh, Distribution gets this. Publishing gets this. Whatever else gets this. The artist gets this. That's true. Should be this. This is the artist and this is the rest. That should be the model. But we are still in the model that came from the last century. I know. But some of us want to break that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Anything is, anything is unstoppable. Yeah. Absolutely unstoppable. And I was telling to you know, I was talking to Sarah Brunstad from Marvel the other day, the, the Thor and Captain Marvel editor, and I was telling her, no bullshit. I think if we have an, a future in comics, the future of comics is women. 
because what you're bringing to the table in terms of editorial, in terms of art, in terms of writing, is something that American comics have never had. And they need it because if you feel, oh my God, we sold 70 million, uh, sorry, 70,000 copies. We're so happy. I go back and say, let me see, population of the United States, 350 million people. You happy selling 70,000? Mm -hmm. And then when I said, go and check book scan, throw, right. throw the diamond, you know, charge to the, to, to the bin, to the, you know, trash bin, and then see how my, how much manga sells, how Raina Taylor Meyer, how you, how Dogman sells. That's the real world. And that's what we have to reach. And the moment we reach the real world, that's why I think you artists are going to have the control. Because if your name becomes that big in the level of general audience, who has the control? Clooney, Brad Pitt, et cetera, et cetera. They have final cut. The director, has, Spielberg has final cut. They make so much money that they, they's like, oh, I have the decision on this or this is not happening. Right. So I think that's the thing is reaching a much wider audience is going to is gonna make the creator have the power in the end. Do you agree or do you think I'm talking nonsense? No, I, I very much agree. I think it's, I think you're, you're speaking truth. No, it had, and it I like had, it. It had to happen sometime. Uh, all jokes aside, tell, tell me one thing. Why, why comics? For me? Why, yeah. For you, it was like, it was something you've always wanted to do or something that suddenly you were like from your gut. You know what? I have to take this out. have to do it. Um, it's always been storytelling for me. Mm -hmm. I, um, I love storytelling. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's, uh, I think it's magic. Mm -hmm. I think that when you can tell somebody a story, you can put them in a place that they weren't before. You can, mm -hmm. you can change their heart. You can change their mind. You can change your country, mm -hmm. you can change <coughs> anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that's magic. That's a spell. Yeah, absolutely. It's about being a good witch and um, casting a good spell. Yeah. And <clears throat> let me ask you this. In one of my many weird questions, don't be surprised because all my questions are weird. Um, if I told you storytelling wise, for you, comics storytelling, is it a symphony? Is it rock and roll or is jazz? Um, I, I guess if I had to pick of those three, I would probably... Well, you don't have to pick of those three. You can say whatever you want, <laughs> of course. Oh. That's an interesting thing to transpose it into understanding it by virtue of music. Mm -hmm. um, I would think it was perhaps something more mysterious in terms of it being almost like the sound you hear when you're in the womb, whatever mm -hmm. those sounds would be. Um, I think it's something where you have a baseline and that is your mother's heart. You're, you're really trying to listen for your mother's heart, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you have your own heart. Mm -hmm. So I think it's almost like um, it's a mysterious thing. And I don't think that, uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, sorry, I can't, I, I love symphonies. I'm very appealed to by the idea of it being a symphony. Yeah, I don't know. That's a mm -hmm. great question. Thank you. It's one uh, of those questions that I'm like, wow, I need to think about this for a while. You know? No, it's, it's mostly because I always, many people says, let me know if you agree with this or not. Many people says that they equal, equal you know, they put movies as close to comics. And I always say, I think that music and poetry are mm -hmm. much closer much much closer to you know what I, I i think that's very interesting i like that thought and i have to think about it about um music and poetry because to me 
Uh, I grew up going to um, the Chicago Historical Society on Saturdays when I was a kid, and they would show silent films. Mm -hmm. They had all of these silent films that were, some of them on the verge of just falling apart, and they would show them. And I think I probably saw things that don't even exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, the closest thing in the world of movies or music is silent films. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're the, the, the grandparents of comics, really. Because you, know, you have images and you have words and they exist you know, they exist in the same plane, but also compositionally, silent pictures really relied on composition mm -hmm. so much more heavily than pictures with sound do. Uh, composition had to do the work that sound uh, does now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that is another reason that they're really close mm -hmm. comics. Yeah. It, I, I always think it's because of the, of the rhythm, you know, for me, comics are about always about rhythm and right. about filling the gaps with your brain and the imagination, which is the part that I say about poetry. And the part about music is, you know, how, how storytelling flows. Mm -hmm. We have big scene, maybe a splash page, you know what I mean? Then we go and relax, then we go up again. That's why I always say superheroes for me, the opera or symphony. There's that, mm -hmm. that, you know, all this, like your job, for example, I always think about you like like jazz. Really? Yeah, I, I really? saw it and I was like, this is jazz. Because mm, in a way, it, correct me, of course, it's, uh, it read as, that something so free, like it was completely you. Yeah. And this is something that for me, it, that's it jazz. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I take that as a compliment. Thank you. Um, well, it's supposed to yeah. be, but if you don't yeah. agree, you can say it, no problem. <laughs> I mean, very much I take it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true. I mean, I think you made a good, it, it is me, you know, I do what I do. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody should, you know. If not, why bother, as, as they say. Um, exactly. For you, what is the when you're starting a page or even even the full story before you start what is the first things that you're drawn to instinctively I mean, you know your heart your gut not you know, your brain is the emotional parts or the structure of the story you want to tell uh for one thing i don't script out a story usually i don't mm -hmm. know what's going to happen i didn't with the book really know where it was going uh, which is like a high wire act if you're drawing a lot and writing because you can, once you take a turn, you can't untake that turn. It takes, you know, you've drawn all your characters. It's it's much more difficult than when you're writing a text, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think the first, the biggest challenge is the problem solving. It's that anytime you throw down, you've made a commitment and then you have to follow it with something else that keeps the emotional stakes high. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest challenge is trying to keep your stakes high mm -hmm. and retain threads that you're trying to pull out the piece, uh, whatever they are, if they're thematic or whatever. But you're absolutely right in terms of it being an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. It's about, I mean, what's in my head is that I'm going to a moment that has an emotional uh, subcurrent in it. And I'm traveling to that time. And then I move to another one. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think it's beats, you know, that you are moving in beats. But they don't feel uh, structural. They don't have any words at all, really, because that kind mm -hmm. of level of emotion is just pure emotion. Mm -hmm. You have to find a way to translate it into something that can be understood. Absolutely. And that's a challenge. That's when it's it's difficult because, um, I mean, there are some, you learn the tricks. You know, mm -hmm. you learn that if you're looking up at somebody, they're powerful. If you're looking at down at somebody, they're very small. And maybe those are moments that you can use those things to tell, 
to put people in mind of an emotion. But the emotion is a magical thing. Mm -hmm. That's, I think what I do is that I'm feeling it when I'm drawing. And I think it translates in a way that I don't understand and that I don't know if there's any science for understanding that. Mm -hmm. I see it um, in other people's work. I feel it. I, I experience the impact of the emotion that the work was created in. Mm -hmm. And it can be really uh, profound. Mm -hmm. I love that experience. I think you, you already answered this question, but continuing with that, um, then for you, what's more important, the journey or the destination? Oh, it's all journey. You know, it's all journey. Um, there is no destination. I don't think we ever die. I don't mm -hmm. think we ever get there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I personally believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's an end to this world. I think that even if they try to upload us into the singularity, um, <laughs> the problem is that uh, when we die, we come back in another life. I mean, we're mm -hmm. never going to be we are never going to be defeatable because our magic is so great mm -hmm. that anybody who is thinking about defeating us, and I'm talking about the whole species, um, they don't, to think that thought means that you don't even understand us. You don't even understand the power of what we are. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we don't understand the power of what we are. That's the bigger problem mm -hmm. because these enemies we have, they don't even matter. Our problem is the enemy inside. Yeah. And also having lost so much of the ancient, um, of the ancient knowledge, you know. I am from uh, from Galicia in Spain, uh, which is, means, literally means in, in Latin, Galaecia, land of the Celts. Oh, really? So I can imagine it's, yeah, it's, it's a little story. Um, Galicia is the place where you have the, the, the the Celts came there. Romans call it Finisterre, which means ends of the world, end of the world. Because if you go west, the only the closest thing is America. So they could only go north. Really? And that was Scotland and Ireland. It's called what? It's, it, and that is Scotland and Ireland. An island, okay. So we are the ancestors. So part of the Celtic magic circle. And, and as you can imagine, we're full of that mysticism and that love for the gods of the of the earth the goddesses of the earth and oh. my land has always been a mat matriarchy is there is the right word mm -hmm. matriarchy so mm -hmm. that's why I've always i i've say i've said the same thing you can't stop it you know even if you think you can you can't sooner or later the knowledge that knowledge is going to come right. back people more and more people is going to no don't worry yeah. more, more and more people is going to embrace it when they realize, you know, all those other things they tried to feed them, right? They were lies, and and I am a really close guy to science, as I always say. If I have a religion, it's Carl Sagan, because I grew up with cosmos. But that yeah. doesn't, that, unfortunately, that doesn't deny the other part because right. he also was a guy who loved life and loved to, you know, to be optimistic about things. And right. I think that's that's that should be our main goal as a species, right? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I, I, Einstein said something that I really liked, and I don't have the quote exactly, but he said that the, and I think Tesla reiterated it as well. He said that the <laughs> great strides in science will be made when we uh, begin to explore the unseen, and he regarded the human spirit as. I, I think they're making enormous strides. There are studies and, you know, I mean, they're just the power of what we are is mm -hmm. this, our capacity to create. It's, um, it's much greater than we understand. Yeah. As, as Arthur C. Clarke, you know, once said, and I love this quote, this magic is the science that we still don't understand. Magic so, is what? Magic is the science that we still don't understand. Yeah. I so like they that. are so related, and science is our power, as magic is our power. Right. And I always say, back in the day, guys, remember, it was called a schools of arts and sciences. Neither right. try to tell you, no, they're two separate things. My ass, they are not. They should be like this, always, right. because they are right. to go to the two ways we have to knowledge, right? 
agree. Can I ask you a question about where you come from? Do you have a lot of green men there? The green men? A lot of and green we, men? Yeah, and we have La Santa Compaña, which is, how can you explain this? When you, I, I should get you a, a, to a book. Have, have you heard of a book or a movie called The Animated Forest? Mm, I don't think El so. Bosque Animado? Okay, if it's not published in the, in the US, let me know and I'll get it for you. It was yeah. some, it, it, what? Who is the author? Uh, Buenceslao Fernández Flores. Okay. And it's, it summarizes very well our relation with mysticism in my land. It's the uh, animated forest? The animated? The animated forest? They, they have, they, there's two versions the, the, of, the, of the movie, the, the animated one, and the you know the the live action one, and then of course there's there's the original book. It's a lot of versions illustrated and not, but um, tells about many things. One of them is I don't know if you know about this. La Santa Compaña is when you're about to die, you see by your window, you know guys with white robes with a farolillo. I don't know how you call it. You know with a light, hand light, and if you see them with that hand light, that means you're gonna die. So you don't resist. You just walk out the door and join them, and they take you to to mm. your destination. So it's it's a different relation with with death than the rest of Spain. More close to you know to a Finnegan's Wake in Ireland. You know, Thank celebration you. of life, not mourning because he because somebody has has died. You know, we're we're an isolated part of the country too. And as you can see, in my case, yeah, it sounds fascinating though. Well, I like yeah. that. That's good. That means wheels are turning. That's what it means to me, anyway. Wheels yeah. are turning. Wheels are <laughs> in a crazy way, in my way. Um, let let me try. I'm I'm talking too much. Sorry. Um, if we talk about, we were talking about the storytelling, the relations to you know magic, math, and all. Um, how much do you think of creation is uh, active thought? You know, like thinking about it and creating, or inspiration? Um, you know, I think ins inspiration is really important, but <laughs> I, I keep it like, you know, every stove, most store stoves have four burners. You know, the inspiration burner, it's always going. It's always there. It's always stewing. There's something going there that's mm -hmm. fine but you you need more than spices you know i mean the inspiration is almost like the spice you know and you need other ingredients to make a meal mm -hmm. you can't just have a meal that's 100 percent oregano uh you know um <clears throat> so i mean inspiration is really important but it guides you but it you have to work you know, you have to work and you have to do boring things. Mm -hmm. Boring things. I like draw somebody a thousand times and and draw draw them and go, you know, they're not looking at the other person. The way I've drawn them, it looks like they're looking away from the other person. I have to redraw them. I mean, that's boring. It's terrible, you know. <laughs> it's terrible. But you have to do all of that. Um so that you can give people the best experience you can give them. I think it's about being a servant. You give people as much as you can give. Mm -hmm. And the other side of it would be, have it, has it ever happened to you that your characters have re rebelled against you? Like yeah. this is the direction I want to go. And then I'm like, nope. No, no. Nope. It, it did happen. It has and happened. And who wins? Well, they do. I mean, they do because then I try to do things and they say, I was never willing to do this anyway. So nothing works. I can't make them do it. And yeah, that's, it's happened more than once. Mm -hmm. No, uh, Greg Rocker was telling me three months ago that when he was finishing his second novel, First arc, easy. Second arc, easy. Get, go to the third arc, and suddenly all the characters said, no. No? Why not? No, no, no. This is not me. This is not what I could do. Stop. And he was a month trying to force them into doing what he wanted. 
yeah. and it didn't work until he changed the scratch, you know, the whole finish, the whole third arc, yeah, and it started again. It didn't work. He had to, he told me, I had to accept it, you know, yeah. they have a lot of their own, right? They were in charge, yeah, it's right, but you know, I mean. I had a fight with Karen because she does something that she doesn't like that she did. And I have to tell her, but you still did it. And she said, I um, don't like that I did it. And I said, well, you're going to have to do it. And you, we had a long fight. It was a fight. I'm not yeah, kidding. Well, no, but it's, it's like real life, you know, deal with it. You, you do things that you, in hindsight, just, oh, I'm, oh my God. I would have not, not not to have done that. Yeah, right. well, you did it. You know, it's too late. Yeah, it's too late. That's right. <laughs> okay. So, um, if you try to look in the um, to other art forms, to other art forms, you know, not not just comics, what would be your? I hate to call them influences, but you know, your reference in terms of uh, movies, paintings, uh, anything else. Everything that you know passes through your brain and influences what you do in comics. You mean uh, as a group? Like if I say I enjoy movies, they inform my comics, or no, no, no. no. Inside movies, inside novels, inside you know, uh, what uh, what movies can, think you can can influ have influenced you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Movies, directors, actors, whatever, whatever you whatever you can say has influenced you as a creator. So much, so many things have influenced me. Uh, but, you know, right off the top of my head, uh, a few years ago, I was working on the book, as a matter of fact, and I read uh, on audio, because I have to draw all the time, so I read my books on audio. I read Donna Tartt's uh, The Goldfinch, and mm -hmm. um, I thought it was brilliant. And it, it um, I mean, I laughed, and I cried, and uh, I haven't seen the film. Yeah, that was a powerful book and i loved the way that she she loved her characters you felt her love for her characters you felt it this is a very important thing i can honestly say that i can't be a character whom i don't love mm -hmm. i love every one of them even when i maybe wouldn't like to meet them you mm -hmm. know i love them um in terms of movies, uh, there are so many that I almost couldn't even respond to. Uh, I mean, I think when I first fell in love with movies, uh, well, as an almost adult, maybe 16 or something, it was it was Blade Runner. <laughs> I love Blade Runner. Um, mm. It's still, I will watch it. I watch it about every month. Um, Which version? The, the first. And the... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the voiceover one? The director's cut, yeah. No, I think it is the direct, the voiceover one, yeah. No, that's the original. Every, every director's cut, Ridley Scott cut, cut the, the narration, the voice. I like the narration voice, though. I do. Um, but I like it without, too. I mean, I'll watch it either way. I've mm -hmm. seen it both ways. And I have recently saw it in the theater before COVID. Anyway, um, yeah, there are a lot of movies me. They help me. Um, they help me remember how really important stories are. Uh huh. And, um, I, I can think of some. I, I loved uh, Magnolia. I loved American Beauty. Um, oh, there's so many though. Uh, recently, I saw Roma, and I loved it very much. It was that was an amazing film. Um, and Pan's Labyrinth, and uh, I liked Shape of Water. Um, I got to meet the person who helped Del Toro write Shape of Water. He lives not very far from me, and he's an amazing writer. His the actual book, Shape of Water, is fantastic. It's um, it's different enough from the movie that you could you could listen to it. I did on audio, or you could read it, and you would get so much more from it because it's really so much of the book is from the perspective of the villain. Mm. And being inside of this particular villain is fantastically interesting. He's very interesting. Um, I can't, Michael Shannon played him in the film and did a beautiful, amazing job. Uh, but, the, but he must have read this because this informs the character so deeply. 
Absolutely. Um, there, I, I don't know. And it's normal because it's a Guillermo del Toro movie, and of course Guillermo is going to turn it into Guillermo's universe right. every time. And well, I'm not saying this as a bad thing at all, but no. it means that it's so good that you can read the novel, right. and it's going to be a different thing, right? A different thing, completely, in some ways, yeah. The other movie happened, I think it took place in Barcelona. It was beautiful. Um, but Javier Berdem was in it. Did oh, yes. It? yes. It, was, it was amazing. That was an amazing film. Um, and he's such a great actor, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just. Uh, I watched. I, I watched the trailer for his new movie uh, yesterday. I think uh, Amazon is going to release it. Really? Uh, let, let me, yeah. Let me find you the name because Amazon Prime uh, bar them with El Fanning. Hmm. I, I'm probably. I'm pretty sure you're going to know the. The road's not taken. The road, the road not taken? The road's not taken. The road's not taken? Mm -hmm. oh. With Bardem and Fanning, and it's, uh, to summarize it, I always saw the trailer, and I was like, oh, this is going to be good. A guy that in the real world is, like, absent at all. Don't, you know, like, people think he might be dying. He does. He's not responsive. His, his daughter is the only one who wants to bring him back. But in his mind, he's living the two lives he was never able to live in reality. Interesting. And I was watching the trailer, and it's, oh, oh my God, Bardem is going to kill it. Because it's like two different guys at different ages, two different versions of himself, you know, and the lives he could have had. And his life is so empty that in his head, he has to live those possible lives he never had. Yeah, I love that. I can't wait to see that. When is that coming out? Uh, let me see. Uh, it's uh, in, uh, it's on rental now in, in Amazon Prime US. It's already on rental, in, really? and, you can buy, and you can buy it. Yeah. I, yeah. I would love to write something just for him as an actor. I would love to write a movie just for him. Well, and other actors too, but I mean, I feel like there's he's got um, he has this way of letting you into his space. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very there's a generosity in him. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that I think that that couple, you know, him and Penelope. Yeah, they're both amazing. The, ta she the talent, you know. Sometimes Penelope gets again the same thing. Oh, she's so pretty, so hot. She can't but, be a good actor, and you are like, what the? No, she's amazing. No. Look at her movies with Pedro Almodovar. Any of them. She she's kills it every time. Yeah, she's great. I've seen her. I've seen her twice. Just blow me away. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, they should. I, they, they, I think they were in something I saw together that was pretty amazing. Uh I remember they were together in uh, Biki Cristina Barcelona. Yeah. The Woody Allen one. Yeah. That's but that movie for me is. You didn't like it. Not even close to being average Woody yeah. Allen. Not even not even one of the good ones. Not even average. It was just very the uh, that era where Woody Allen did yeah. movies in every town that could give him money to make a movie. Right. Okay? It was kind of like um a Hollywood film. You know what I mean? Yeah. You watch yeah. it and you can't really remember because I'm sitting here thinking, what was that about? Do you know what I mean? Um yeah, I saw recently. I saw Shirley with uh, Elizabeth Moss. It was very good. She's an incredibly good actor. Mm -hmm. She, um, you never think, oh look, it's Elizabeth Moss acting. You're there. You're right with her. Um, and uh, that was about Shirley Jackson, the horror writer. And I loved, I love movies about writers because we are weirdos and. Um, not great human beings a lot of the time. <coughs> now, it's good to, you know, that's something that I think the Europeans do better. You accept the fact that artists are people and flawed. Mm -hmm. Americans really want artists to be perfect. And artists are not perfect. Artists are not role models. They're mm -hmm. actually the opposite of role models. It's like, yeah. look at an artist's life, and if you want, if you want a happy child, generally, 
tell your child not to do most of what that artist did. Um, and so I just, I feel like it's doom to expect um, great things from artists as people. As role, as role models, yes, yes, yeah. yes. No, there, is, there is some that are, I prefer, for example, I believe that George Clooney is a role model because of what he's done for years, what he, the work he does with his wife. But yeah. the hero, as Clooney could tell you, and he said it often, no, I'm not the hero. The hero is her. You know, she's the one that, you know, has her life in risk every day for the last 15 years, you know? But, really? but by the end of the day, I think in, in our case, it's, it's, it's exactly the opposite, you know? We take it so much for granted that artists are failable in that way, fit yeah. play, that we go too far and we just accept it. You know, oh, Picasso, he, you know, he was horrible to all his wives. Yeah. He was a bad man, a real bad, he was. Yeah. And you're really like, well, yeah, but he's a genius. And sometimes, like, wait, 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 wait. No, but he's a genius, no. You can say he was a bastard and a genius. No, but. Right. So we just accept it as part of the, of the game that artists are going to be that way. You know, Gauguin and all the others. If you go back, you know, uh, who was the, um, the one who was uh, literally a murderer? Caravaggio. Caravaggio, exactly. It's like, you know, you have Caravaggio. You have a lot of examples from the 15th century to now. Well, not to now, but to, you know, 19th century. Where we're, literally, we're just literally killing each other. Well, there's a very good case, actually. Patricia Cornwell, the uh, mystery writer, yeah. wrote a very credible book. You have to read it to believe me. That William Sickert, the uh, British artist, the British painter, was actually... Jack the Ripper. And when you read it, I mean, you might think that's ridiculous. No, no. I thought it was ridiculous. Alan Moore's version, I thought it was ridiculous until I read From Hell. So maybe when I read this, I'm going to say, oh. I, okay. I'm going to ask you uh, uh, if you read it in a while. And uh, I think you will be amazed at the good ca the case she makes so many years after i mean there are things where um they did they were receiving these letters that they dismissed they said they couldn't possibly come from the killer you there you're frozen i don't know if you can hear me emil Your signal is in red now. I don't know if you can hear me. It's getting better now. Okay, good. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you now. It's getting better. For a second, for like five seconds, your signal went from green to red to no 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 quality of signal at all. It seems to get better. You have two points now, so it seems to get getting better. So you were saying sorry. I don't know where, where did you lose me. Let's make a check. You can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I can. You know, some somewhat uh, somewhat distorted, but again, this happens all the time with the signal. It goes, it fades down, and it, it goes up. We'll we'll just make do. Um, when you watch, uh, we were talking about horror movies or paintings or comics, horror. What makes you think that a villain is a good villain? And what makes you think, oh my God, not again? Um, villain. Well, I really think the monster, and I separate monster and villain, because I think the monster is usually not really a villain. Um, that's see. That's why I use the word villain. It's, it was really right. specific. Because again, right. same thing. I don't consider the Frankenstein monster the villain. I can see no. the doctor of Victor Frankenstein, yeah. Frankenstein the villain. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think, yeah. Um, I watch old horror films. I Right now I'm going through the films again. I'm oh. watching all the old Frankensteins. There are so many of them. 
Um, I really enjoyed a documentary that's out there. It's called um, Dreams with Sharp Teeth. It's about Harlan Ellison. Have you seen it? No, um, no, 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 no. Dreams with Sharp Teeth. It's on Amazon Prime. Oh, I, oh. Um, I don't know if it's in Amazon Spain, but I'll find it. Dreams yeah. with Sharp Teeth. And he Thanks. says he says so many interesting things. He's a very fierce um, man. Oh, and yeah. You'll find him interesting. I found him interesting. No, um, everybody, everybody I know that was an acquaintance with with Harlan tells me the same thing. That most of the times you were you had to be like, calm down, stop, breathe. breathe. Yeah. You know, yeah. you cannot be at one hundred and fifty percent every time. Yeah. Uh, so, who do you know that knows him? Marcello, Marcello, uh, uh, Howard Chaykin, uh Who else? For sure, those two. But um, people of Howard's generation. You know, and and you know, I know I know Jim Starling knew, knew him too. Uh, probably Walter, not sure, but probably Walter and Wissy, Sim Simonson. Um, right. mo most of the guys of the you know Bernie Wrightson for sure. Wow. All the guys from that generation that were in the studio in Connecticut were Jim Howard and the others were, and the guys in the studio were Barry Bernie and the others were. I'm right. pretty sure, if not all of them, most of them knew Harlan. Right. Interesting character. Um, definitely, yeah, interesting, very, I, I enjoyed them, I enjoyed, but one of the things I really liked was that he talked a lot about, um, just the business of creation, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed that, and, uh, and then I watched a documentary <laughs> about Hammer Films, and I didn't know, there was a lot I didn't know about their creation, um, but they're really, they were really important to me as a kid. Mm -hmm. I, I, did you like them? Did you did you watch? I them? love the Hammer movies, but I used to do. You know the Ealing movies, the which? The Ealing. Oh yeah, Ealing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I every time I do a rewatch of the of the Hammer movies, I do like this. You know, Hammer yeah. Ealing, Hammer Ealing, because it was, I won't say exactly at the same time, but it Pretty was. But one was going in one direction, and they were both geniuses. You could see Alec Guinness and all the others in one side, and then, of course, uh, Christopher Lee and all the others, and Peter Cushing, etc., in the other. So for me, it's like being not the whole thing of British creation on those years, but it's right. so amazing to see how diverse they were right. in their roles, and it's so much fun. But the Hammer ones, David I'm going to be weird. My favorite is not... Any direct without funk is is the is the dog of the basketballs. Oh, dog. Okay, on the basketballs. Okay. Um, is uh is the Alec Guinness movie uh, the horse's mouth and Ealing? Yes. That, yeah, I love that movie. I really do love that movie. Uh, it's great. Um. Yeah, I uh, how did the Baskervilles? <coughs> <coughs> I'm gonna have to uh, check that out again. I haven't seen that in a long time. Peter Cushing as uh, Sella Holmes, Christopher Lee as uh, Mr. Baskerville. Yeah, great stuff. Anyway, you sorry, you were talking about about Hammer and how much you love them and I how do. much they hurt you. I um I spend most of my time listening to uh, podcasts about ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, ghost research is one of my favorite things. Uh, recently stayed at a place in Quebec that was haunted, and I had my first—I had my first real ghost experience, um, and it was uh, it was wild. He just—he yeah. just have to go to Toledo, and then I think is everything is haunted in Toledo. Really? <laughs> yeah, Toledo is the only town that we could say I think in the world that had at the same time all religions and all the mysticism together right. as a blend. And there's right. so corners, so many nooks, so many tours. The Toledo tour at night is, is just incredible of all the places, you know, the door of Hercules and all that stuff. Yeah. I think that's one town that probably you, you could, if you get there, you will probably say, I don't want to live here. <laughs> I okay. don't want to go. I don't want to go. I want to stay. I don't want to okay. live. My ancestors come from there. I think my the ancestors I have that are are, are Spanish ancestry is uh, from Toledo. I think that's place a lot of things. <laughs> Sorry, 
it's got to be related, you know, your yeah. your magic and mysticism, etc. Toledo is a, is a is a magical town. I think one of the biggest mistakes Philip Philip II did because it was the capital of Spain, right? Until Philip II said, "Let's move it to Madrid," right? And I think that culturally, that changed the country for the worst because we were a, such a big blend of cultures, mysticism, and it was part of us all. And and see, he separated, you know the capital of the kingdom and, and you know the government etc he separated it from that so i believe that was a mistake and changed the country but if you are ever back here you should go i think i i'm pretty sure that you are when you're stay when you be there when you're there you're gonna say i don't want to go back I, I just need to stay here forever that's gonna happen to me uh david i keep thinking i'm gonna go somewhere and i kind of it started to happen to me when I was in Europe. I started to think I, I'd want to stay. <laughs> but I haven't, I've never felt like I found my place. Mm -hmm. Never felt like I know where I'm at home. And I think mm -hmm. someday I'm gonna go somewhere and I'm gonna go, this is it. This is the yeah. place I belong. And um, yeah, it, it would be easier for me. I love France, but I'm so bad with the language that I, I um, a while ago, I was reading that a very famous photographer, uh, Strand, Paul Strand, mm -hmm. moved to a France, and he never spoke any French, and they tolerated him. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe they tolerated him, so maybe I'll give it a try. But, um, That's one choice. Then you have, if you, and if you want... Another really big mystic part of Europe that speaks your language, of course, you can go to Ireland. Oh well, yeah, but it doesn't speak my language. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, I, okay. No, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I mean, they do, but I mean, I'm just like, my God. Sometimes I, I have friends and they, they tease me in Irish. I have no idea what the heck they're doing, um, and. And that's somewhere I also have ancestors who came from Ireland. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I I don't know anything about them, though. Uh, well, the good thing of being in the European Union is yeah. that you don't have to stay in one place. Now, they're still part of the European Union, right? Ireland. Oh, Ireland will never leave. Good. The problem is if it's the British with Brexit and all that shit. Yeah. And uh, the, the border between Northern Ireland and, uh, and Republic of Ireland. Because right. the, the EU has said from the beginning, we don't want the peace agreements to be demolished by Brexit. You know, there's, there can be no frontiers. And the British are saying, oh, there's got to be a frontier. We don't want to be European Union, blah, blah, blah. And the European Union is saying, I don't give a shit. I care, I care about peace. You care about territory. We care about peace. And if there's a frontier, there's going to be violence again. Right. So that's the situation now. Now, Ireland would never leave. Uh, and Ireland is also part of the euro and all that. Now, except for the UK, you could move, you know, with Schengen. Schengen Treaty is here. You don't have to even show your passport, you know, national card, go, move, etc. because it's, and same with your driving driver's license. It's for all over Europe. Um, so by the end of the day, you can move. Oh, I'm, I'm right now, I can take the car and be in France in three hours. Wow. And I don't, I just, I just, I just cross the border. I don't have to, Hello, how are you? Show your okay. It's you. Go. I wouldn't mind. That. I would be so great. That's, that's a beautiful thing about being here and saying, maybe I am not going to find my place first. But I'm if just, I start one, it'll be another one. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gypsy. I'm a wanderer. Gypsy. I think that's a bad term. We're not supposed to say that anymore. Well, I'm a nomad. I will say it like that. I'm a nomad. There's nothing bad about saying gypsy for me. It's, it's fine. Okay, good. Because, well, I was told by my daughter that's a, that's a derogatory term, and I didn't know that. Um, so I... For me, gitano or gypsy, gitano, the Spanish one, or gypsy are not derogatory. You know, derogatory is, as I always said, if I call you... So what's, got, what's up, you son of a bitch? You know, I'm talking to my friend. There's no derogative there. It's a friend. Yeah. Same thing, gypsy, gitano. It depends on the tone and the context. It, it's right. not the word. So it's, for me, it's not. Okay, uh, good. So we, yeah, we're, I, fine. I we're fine. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I feel like I'm a, a wanderer. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I intend to be anyway. 
Yes. As Carl Sagan said, we are explorers. What would you, if you could do anything now, what would you do? If you could, if, if, if the uh, quarantine was over for you, w would you go somewhere? Would you travel? Probably, yeah. Probably. What I could do probably first would be to take uh, our daughter, six-year-old, to, to Disneyland Paris. Oh, nice. Or to Port Aventura, which is, you know, the, the amusement park we have in Tarragona, which is one hour and 30 minutes, not 90 minutes by car. So that's the first thing. You know, she, she, she's first. She's first. Uh, in fact, right now, right now, my wife is, you know, texting me saying they're at the cinema because they were like, "Oh, we don't want to go without you." Wonder Woman eighty four, and I'm like, "Nah, just go. She's, she's more important. I can watch it any other day." So she's like, "We are in the cinema now. We almost drowned because of the because of the rain, <laughs> but it's fine. It's there, there." So what's that's the first thing. David, what? what's your daughter's name? Erin. What's her name? Erin. 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 How do you spell it? E R I N. Oh, nice. She's got an Irish name. Because I'm Galician, it's all related. I wanted to give her a, to give her a, a Celt name, and okay. it in, and uh, it has two meanings. Just so you know, it's the in, in Gaelic. In Gaelic, it means peace, and it's also the uh, name they use to refer to Ireland in poetry. Really? So it's the Aaron, poet. That's right, Erin Gorbra. I've seen that. I've so seen that. The poet, the poet, the as you know, Chicago is. So Irish, I mean. <laughs> I've, been, I've been there several times. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. And you know. No, yeah. I'm, 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 that's that would be the first, and then tra traveling again, traveling again. You know, Dublin is uh, as a good Celt. You know, Dublin, Kilkenny, Cork, any part of Ireland, and and we love we love Denmark. Do you? Yeah. Is it wonderful? Denmark's wonderful. This is incredible. In many, Dave McKean. Gave me the perfect definition after we saw when we saw each other in Barcelona. I brought him as a guest two, three years ago, and we were talking because we were we have been in in, in Copenhagen for Easter, and we told we told that to Dave, and Dave was like, "You know what? There's something about Copenhagen that I've never seen anywhere else in the world. Everything what? works. Everything works. There's Everything. no other ground. You see all the money they pay in taxes, which is a lot. You see every penny expend." And we hadn't thought about it, but we had realized everything works. And we were like, oh, that's true. That's why it clicked. That's why it was. And they also love kids, love them. You know, the hotel we went to, they have two, two entrances, one for adults and then another one for kids. If you went through the kids one, they had a ping pong table, machines, consoles, you know, a jumping ball and, and a lot of things. So. Okay. It's it's completely different, you know, Ireland and Denmark. But mm -hmm. I I say what I could do is, is to go back to travel. I miss it. If you ask me in March, I could say uh, I'm sick of traveling six times a year to the U.S., know, six times a year to the rest of Europe. But I right would now, that too. But now I wish I could. Anyway, uh, yeah, go I, have ahead. A, I have with I have withdrawal of traveling now. So that would probably be that would probably be be, you know, and take them. Of course, if I could, I could go with them. I, I hate traveling without my wife and my daughter. Oh, I, uh, your daughter, you know, that age is a very wonderful age. Um, yeah. Anyway, do you want us to go with uh, with people's questions so they don't try to kill me later if I forget? Rafa Res, hello, this video promises. Thank you, Rafa. Ferran oh, Pavita. somebody said, okay, okay. You I tell me. What? Somebody wants more details on the eye. So the eye is actually hey, a piece of... You, you just jump to the end. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. It's fine. Here's the eye. The eye is... Uh, hmm, there yes, we go. Nico, Nico Hermisabal said, I need more details on that eye behind the meal. What is it? What is its the story? It's just a part of a, a puppet that I'm making. Okay. A very big puppet. A paper puppet. Nice, really nice. <coughs> okay, okay. I have to go on duty. See you on a delayed basis. Let's okay. go back to the beginning. Let me. You don't have to read them. Don't worry. I read them for you. Uh, Ferran Padilla says, "I saw Emil Ferris last year in Barcelona at a wonderful conversation with Ana Galvani. 
that's that's a coincidence. I had Anna two days ago. Uh, it was so powerful and inspiring. And Emil was such a kind and lovely person. What a special evening. Oh, well, thank you for coming. Thank you for being there. Thank you. Angel Parra, hello, good afternoon. Uh, Angel Parra says, the bite that changed my life tells why she started to dry and roll her own story. What made you decide to write? Uh, when I was uh, when, when I was born, I was born with extremely bad scoliosis. It was um, nobody knew why I didn't walk. I didn't walk until I was almost three years old, and later they realized it was because my spine was so crooked, and for some reason it impacted the size of my feet. They didn't grow um, at all. So um, I spent most of when they discovered my scoliosis. Um, it was really, I, I was quite hunchbacked. And um, my feet were, my legs were different lengths. I had a, I had a block on my shoes that was about that big. That's about the difference in the length, mm -hmm. which made running very painful. Uh, so I couldn't run, I couldn't even walk upstairs very well. I, my dream was that someday I would learn how to skip. <laughs> so I just wasn't, I wasn't an able-bodied child at that time. And I was always alone in the playground, always. Uh, I would stand by the gate and uh, uh, I would just watch the kids playing and I would feel very alone. Mm -hmm. And then one day I decided to tell ghost stories. And I started telling ghost stories. Uh, the first day there was one kid mm -hmm. and the second day there were two kids. And the third day there were six kids. And pretty soon there were 10 kids who would come and stand with me while I told the story. And mm -hmm. I wasn't alone anymore. And I was connecting with them in a place and in a way I could take them into my, into my story. And we were all together in that place. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I loved it. I loved not being alone. And I loved giving them the gift of the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I wanted to do that again. That's why I write. I want, so, to, I want to be with you. So it was the, it was the urge, the pulls to, to tell stories, right? In the end, the yeah. urge you needed to take those stories out of, out of your interior. Right. And, and it's a matter of, I mean, commune to commune with somebody and communication. These things have a root word. I mean, it's about communing. Yeah. It's about coming together and coming into one, you know, mm -hmm. with people. It really is. Yeah. I always say when the, you know, when two creators become too tight, really tight, working with each other, like with Kelly Sue the Conic, I was talking about her and Emma Rios. It's like most of the time I don't know uh, if it's Kelly or Emma. So I think you guys create a third entity which is just the, com the community with both of you and i see it and i think that that happens also with the reader with the comics because in other arts it's very passive you know you watch a movie you, you're reading a book you have to just follow it's passive but with a comic you have you decide when to turn the page what the pace even if you as a creator are telling this is the pace i want you to read it no it's not going to happen they are going to decide the pace so you have to get the reader to commune with you right Right, and I and also um, the other thing I think I think in the in science at all, you're dealing with uh, pictures and words which stimulate two different parts of the brain. Um, so this is we know the Egyptians knew that they did the same thing to create spells. Yes, spells are created when you can stimulate <laughs> those areas of the brain mm -hmm. at the same time, and I think it's very powerful, and I love it. I, I I love it for witch reasons too, you know. Those are not bad reasons at all. No. <laughs> as as I said before, you can love it because of the science, you can love it because of the witchy part, you can love it because of the magic, but in the end I'm going to tell you they are the same with different names. Right. I agree with you. And that's something uh, you would say because, you know, of where you're from. Right. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, Angel Parra Parra, Karen is a girl in, uh, he asks, Karen is a girl in search of her identity who finds refuge in monster and horror comics. 
do you feel a certain responsibility that what I like the most are monster can now be a reference for other Karen? I don't know if he means you would be that other Karen. I'm going to look for that question because um, I feel like I don't understand it very well. I hope he doesn't mean... No, I, I hope she doesn't mean you know how they call the ultra right women in the in America, right? Karen's. Oh, so yeah. I hope he, I don't. I hope he doesn't mean that people thinks sees that kind of Karen because of the name. That's too simple, Uncle. I'm sorry, but I could yeah. move to the next question. <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, maybe I don't know. I don't know. I can't. Mm -hmm. uh, I will I will answer if you allow me. If people does that and they confuse that kind of Karen with this kind of the book, they're stupid. And they don't deserve to read the book. I'm sorry. You gotta be really stupid to confuse those you have temple. You're gonna be the, 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 the warrior in the front of the temple. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I mean I don't want to call anybody stupid because nobody's stupid really, but um yeah, I I was disappointed when I I heard people using that name to, I, I guess I understand what they're trying to do with that, but it's, uh, it's somebody's name. I mean, it's a lot of people's name and it's, it's a kind of a, it's a sad thing to do to, uh, to people. Yeah. I, here, I just don't think it's right. Here we have the equivalent, which is, but it's not a name. It's a, uh, it's a profession, which and it doesn't make it better at all. Verdulero, which is, you know, the guy, or woman who sells vegetables, you know. How do you say it again? People, verdulero. Verdulero? Or, or verdulera, if it's a female. Verdulera. And you always use that for the people who gels a lot. Oh, I see. So this so, means somebody who is hawking their wares or? Uh, so somebody their... who gels a lot of whatever, you know, the name of that profession, since they used to sell that way in the market, has I become a... Can you shut up? You are a verdulero because he's yelling. So uh, it, that profession got that bad name. You, you assume that if right. it's, you know, anybody who yells, it's a verdulero. So I think it's more or less the same that with the current name. We need to make a movie about the quietest person in the world who sells vegetables. And we just, and just call it that because there's an irony to that. Then. Oh, absolutely. That would be, that would be amazing. You know, verdulero. Yeah, and you, make a, and you make a silent movie. Yeah, but uh, really, but make it really make that the power of silence be what's frightening about the movie. Uh -huh. Oh, that 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 that, that, that uh, takes me to ask you something that I forgot before. How important it is silence for you in comics storytelling? The use I, of silence. I'm a lot of the time very silent when I'm working. I can go for days with no. I don't have a television. Um, I don't. I listen to music only <coughs> in in the morning you know, um, or if I'm writing, uh, I can be very quiet for a very long period of time and I need silence. I need nobody talking and, um, yeah, I can't, I can't stand television. I can't stand mm -hmm. the commercials. Um, if I'm around it too long, I want to break it uh -huh. really badly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I need. I, I guess there is silence in the work, um, and inside your stories, how important it is for you to use moments of silence to reflect, right. get the reader to absorb things. The uh, the ghastlies and the and the um, those were really my moments of silence, um, mm -hmm. and they're not fully silent, uh, but they're a way of breathing. Uh huh. It's yeah, a way to absolutely. breathe. Yeah. Okay, let me see <laughs> where I Pedro de Mercaderas. Hello everyone. I just come in to enjoy this great talk. Thank you for your masterpiece, Emil. It has quickly become one of my favorite books ever. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you so much for adding your beautiful imagination to the book and to Karen's world. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time when the book started to become um, bigger than I thought it would. And it, it was increasing. And I remember where I was even. 
uh, I just felt like the book was growing a substance. It was becoming more concrete. It was a creating material. And I asked myself, how is this happening? And then I realized it's because so many people are filling this world with their imaginations. They're creating it and it's becoming real, more and more real. And uh, I, I think um, every writer, the greatest thing a writer can get, you know, money's great and all of that, but the most important thing is having imaginative readers. Mm -hmm. So thank you. As, as, the, as the old saying goes, never talk down to your readers. <laughs> no. Nope. Talk up to them. Right. That's uh, right. As, as, um, would, you love, would you like the idea of seeing your characters on the biggest screen? And who would you like to be the protagonist? Well, uh, that's going to happen. That is actually going to happen. Um, it's in talks right now. Uh, there's there's lots of talk, but it's going to happen. Um, I don't, in terms of having an actor, you're talking about who would I pick mm -hmm. if I had any say in it. I couldn't even begin to, to fathom that. I, I couldn't even begin to figure that out. Um, but there are... Occasionally, I will see women who I wish, they're usually very beautiful, but I wish they would get uh, the bad teeth, and I wish they would play Mrs. Gronin. I mean, uh -huh. she would be, I think, an incredible role for somebody. Um, I sometimes think about who I'd love to see play Anka, and there are some great actresses that I think could really do wonderfully well with her. Um, Yeah, I don't know who would play Karen. I don't know how that would work because I don't know much about actors who are young. And I wouldn't want Karen to be entirely uh, computer generated or anything like that. No. You know, no. I would want her to kind of be played by a person. Yes. I think, I think it's more important to have a real person. Um, I always yeah, say I that practical effects, the more they use them, the better the movies for me. You know, Uh, did you, yeah. did you, I think you're away with me. Jurassic World. I see those dinosaurs and I'm like, eh? CGI. Yeah. It's all CGI. And it looks fake. Right. And it's a lot more technology, a lot more money, a lot more colors and all that. And I go back to Jurassic Park and say, yeah. I love this. You know, these right. creatures, that T-Rex, scares the fuck out of me. You know, the shit out of me. I believe that one. It's real. You know, it stumps on the floor and you see that's real. Right. So, I, you know, why do it CGI when you can do it with practical effects, right? Right. I agree. I agree. Okay. Daniel Badosa says, hi, Miss, uh, Mrs. Ferris. Concerning the relationship between art and fear, he says fear with brackets, how should artists approach their fears in their work? And consequently, what are you most afraid of and how you deal with it? Well, those are great questions. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I think the whole the whole work of art is fear. I mean, that's what we're doing. We are working with fear. We're working side by side with fear. Um, because I think, you know, uh, the Bible says uh, perfect love uh, casts out fear. So there's this way that we're told that fear and love Are opposites, you know. It's not fear and hate. Um, it, it's uh, it, or not hate and uh, and love. It's it's fear and love. But I don't know that we're really. I think that to be an artist is such an act of courage um, that you are brave just by virtue of being an artist. You're courageous, yeah, yeah. because. It requires that you feel fear and do it anyway. Yes. And that is just the hardest thing to do is to carry to carry your, your fear mm -hmm. in, into battle with you, which is what courage is, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid all the time in like a bunch of different ways. Um, 
I think uh, one of the ways that I like to talk to people, both people my age <clears throat> and people who are younger, is I like to reassure them because, you know, the long way home is also a way home. Uh -huh. You know, a really long time. Yeah, here, I, I did a lot of things. I cleaned houses. I kept my child alive. I was a single parent. Um, I had, had illnesses that I had to do. And, um, you know, broken dreams. There were things I wanted to do that I didn't end up doing. Instead, I, I maintained work. And I worked hard for years. Uh, but what I did every day, unfailingly, is I did I wrote and I drew mm -hmm. every day, even if it was a sentence, only a sentence, even if it was uh, the smallest drawing. And the reason I say that, and the reason I want to talk about failure, because I think it's so important, is that uh, the only secret to success is that you just don't stop. You just yeah. keep going. Yeah. And is, never surrender, never stop trying. And uh, um, take the pressure off of yourself. You see, you don't have to be successful by the age. You mm -hmm. know, you also take the pressure off if you're 55 and you always wanted to 